Welcome back to part 2 of our workflows video on our Basics of Bubble series. Now in the last video clearly we went ahead and set up a login logout system, user accounts and we also looked at how you can essentially set conditional visibility on pages or elements depending on, on whether or not a user is logged in. Now what we're going to do is take the workflows a little bit further because we're going to add the ability to actually go ahead here and rate a dog on a Rate My Doggy website and we'll also even add the ability to put another dog on this list. So before we get cracking into all of that, I want to take a little bit of time just to show you the various things you can do in Bubble Workflows. I've used a lot of no-code tools as you can imagine and when it comes to just sheer level of customizability, it's really hard to imagine a tool right now that beats Bubble. So whenever you build a workflow, you're gonna build workflows generally depending on various different pages. So on our index, these are all the um, workflows we've got. If I switch over to the add dog page, then you know I've got a couple of different ones here. And you can chop and change them and share them between um, pages. But the reason for that is quite typically a bubble workflow is gonna kick off based on a front end event. Now, if you remember from our no code fundamentals lessons, an event is a trigger that comes from the front end. But of course, bubble also has this hidden option here called back end workflows. And that is gonna let me add you know, completely non-user triggered events. I can have stuff that comes from an API endpoint. I can have a recurring event that can happen on any frequency I like. Or I can have an event that waits uh, for a database change to happen and then does something based on that. So for example, you know, if I was to um, update something on the dogs database, then I could have a, a workflow that runs every time that trigger occurs. You know, Bubble is still going to use the phrase event for most of this, but on the back end, we call these a trigger. On the front end, we call them an event. And if you don't have this showing up on your bubble page, by the way, all you've got to do is pop down here to settings, hit the API tab, enable a uh, workflow API and back end workflows, and enable your data API as well. And that will bring this little menu up. But we're not going to worry too much about that for now. Let's go ahead and build a workflow that actually interfaces with what we've got already. So when I click here to add an event, we've already looked at a couple of these. Clearly the most common one is an element is clicked. And that just means when some sort of component on your front end, your you know, the visual part of your site, the page, whenever the user clicks something, it could trigger this workflow. And when I go in there, I can just select whatever element I like. And I've got all these different elements from my page. Um, now, You've got a few other things in here that are pretty useful. For example, an input's value is changed. Essentially what that means is, imagine you had a box where a user was typing in a password, for example, and you wanted to, before they hit the sign up button, you know, as soon as they finished putting in that, that uh, potential password, you want to quickly tell them, well, you know, it's too long or it's too short or you've not got a special characters or whatever. This is the kind of workflow you can do to run on there. So you could simply click that. You could set up a workflow that, you know, picks whatever, um, you know, input field you want. And then you could come in here and specify conditions like check if the, um, you know, we've got here rating comment, you know, check if the rating comment is more than 500 characters long, for example, whatever you want to do. Um, you've got a few other cool ones in here, you know, you can do something when a pop-up is opened or closed, and you've got this one here, an element has an error running a workflow. This is really interesting. So essentially, you can set up a workflow that handles um, the problem if any other workflow breaks. So you could have a workflow that, you know, if any of your workflows, no matter what it is, if they break, something doesn't go uh, to plan, if there's some sort of error, you could have another workflow that maybe pops up a wee message that says, oh, sorry, you know, something went wrong. And that could also trigger an email back to yourself to kind of say, look, one of your users had a problem. You could do whatever you want there, but essentially this will run whenever something else goes wrong. Back in the general tab, now we've looked at a couple of these, but you've got one that says, well, when the user's logged in or when the user's logged out, um, those are clearly kind of two key events. Um, you get a really interesting one here, page is loaded. So whenever um, a user goes from one page to another, and this might sound obvious or trivial, by the way, but just to explain it, you know, whenever a user goes from one page to another, there's a brief kind of period where, let's say I click, you know, if I'm on this website here, when I click add a dog, there's then a brief period while the other page is loading up. Well, it's downloading everything it needs to actually show that in my browser. And then what will happen is typically, now this isn't going to work because I'm logged in, but if you watch this, uh, when that goes up, this is the loading period. And then only now when the page appears has this loaded. Whenever that happens, you can kick off a workflow that could do something. You know, I could have a workflow that comes in and checks if I'm logged in and does something or whatever I want to do. You'll remember that 
one of the workflows that we set up, uh, I think on the previous video, we kind of said, well, when the page is loaded, if the user can't get on to a dog uh, because they're not logged in, here we go, when the page is loaded, then if the user uh, isn't logged in, kick them back to the index page, navigate them back there. So that's an example of how you would use um, the page load event. So tons of other stuff you can do here. I'll just point out one other, uh, two others that are pretty interesting. Um, so you can do something every five seconds. That's quite a good way to check um, if something's happened, if the user's done something. You know, if you're just checking every five seconds, right, is this condition true yet? Is that condition true? Um, you could also use it to, you know, update something on the page. I'll give you an example. You ever go on one of these websites where the headline of the page says something um, and it, like, it maybe says something like, you know, get yourself a new car, except the word car then changes to get yourself a new Land Rover, get yourself a new Ferrari, get yourself a new BMW, and the text just kind of cycles through. Well, one of the ways that you could do that is to run a little workflow that says every five seconds, change that element on the page, change that piece of text. You could use it for a ton of stuff, but it's a really interesting little thing that you might think, well, I don't need to do it every five seconds. But if you think really hard, there's a good chance this could be a really useful piece of logic for you. And then, of course, we've got this other one that, that kind of does a similar thing. It says do when condition is true. So what it's saying is run this workflow whenever some sort of condition becomes true. So whatever I put in here. So I could say, you know, run this condition when the user's email contains, you know, at Hotmail. So I could have a workflow that only runs if the current user's uh, email contains Hotmail, um, or I could have one that runs based on the time of day, I could have one that only runs for people who are from a certain country, let's say, I don't know, I wanted to show a promotion to people um, who's a, who are based in Spain, then I could quite simply set up a condition that says, um, you know, uh, when the current geographic position is, you know, Spain, however I want to set that up, I could do distance from, link to Google Maps, etc., but lots of different stuff you can do in there. And basically what will happen is every single split second that somebody's on your app, Bubble will just keep checking to see if that condition is true yet or not. You know, is the person, uh, what well, is the current time of day, you know, 10.56? If so, run the workflow. If not, keep checking. And, you know, it'll just do that kind of thing over and over and over again until your condition is hit. And so let's take a little bit of a look. If that kind of covers all the triggers, and by the way, you do have one in here called Custom. It's pretty complex. Um, you probably won't have to worry about it on day one. Uh, Bubble have got a lot of documentation on it, but you can essentially set up any event trigger you like, um, but definitely not for the faint of hearted. It probably needs a little bit of Bubble experience before you dive into that. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of the actions that are then available, and there are a ton of these. You've even got a search bar here because there are so many. We've looked at some of the ones in account, so, you know, we can sign a user up, we can log them in, we can log them in with a social network like, you know, Twitter, Facebook, etc. Log them out, tons of stuff you can do here, and a couple of interesting ones that I think just demonstrate how powerful Bubble is. You know, stuff I've never seen in no-code tools before, like create an account for somebody else, assign a temporary password to a user, um, you know, log out another user session. Some really, really interesting stuff here. Where would you use that? Well, for example, if you wanted an administrative account, you might use that. Or if you were building, um, you know, a tool for work and you wanted a, a user who could, um, you know, control who else and your team gets in and out and log them in and out, that kind of thing. That's where this is useful. And I think it just shows the staying power of Bubble. You know, Bubble is about roughly a decade old by now. Um, and so... There are a lot of different use cases and edge cases that people have ran into that Bubble have had the time to go and build out something specific for. Because doing something like assigning a temp password to a user is definitely non-core functionality. That's definitely uh, down the rabbit hole slightly. So um, moving on to navigation, we've looked at some of these as well. Clearly you can push the user to a page, you can refresh the page, you can go back to a page, you can send them to another website. Um, and do a little thing in here called adding a pause before the next action. So say you had one workflow step and you wanted to wait 10 seconds before you ran the next one. Well, you can do that here with this action as well. And you can also terminate it. So you could do a condition that says, you know, terminate this uh, workflow if some condition is true. But if that condition is not true, keep going to the next action. You can put that right in the middle of a workflow. It's a really good way to do some sort of kind of branching logic. Um, now, last thing I just want to point out here, if you're using Bubble to build a mobile app, which typically you can do uh, through various Bubble plugins, 
you're going to have to kind of control um, where the user goes because they're not going to have an address bar to type stuff in. And so as a result, you might want to have a button, for example, at the top left uh, corner of your screen where it is in most apps that can simply take the user back a page. So this is where the go to previous page action is really useful. If you're building mobile, you're going to have a bunch of buttons that say either go to previous page or go to the next page. If we pop into data things, this is where we get our usual CRUD methodology. Um, now, if, you, if you're not familiar with CRUD methodology, please go and watch the No Code Workflow Fundamentals, um, because in there I've got a lesson on CRUD methodology. It stands for Create, Read, Update, Delete, um, and it is essentially a framework for thinking about how you make changes to your database and how you move data around. So we've got all the basics in here. Um, you know, creating a new database role, making changes to a database role. And by the way, um, Bubble will say thing, thing, you can just think of as meaning a database role. It's a little bit simpler language, but, you know, you can create a new thing, you can make changes to a new thing, so you can update a, an existing list. Um, oh, excuse me, you can delete something. And a couple of really interesting actions here that I like. You can have a button that downloads data as a CSV. A CSV file, of course, is a spreadsheet that works across Excel, Apple Numbers, whatever spreadsheet tool you like, Google Sheets. Um, but you can have a button that lets them download data as a CSV. And of course, you can also have a button that lets your user upload data as a CSV by putting these uh, workflows in. I think that's really, really cool. I've not seen that in many no-code tools. And yet, you'll probably um, have realized before that the ability to import and export data that way via a spreadsheet file is really, really commonplace now across a lot of different SaaS or software as a service applications. Now, one of the things you'll have noticed down there is we've got this little bit that says in store, uh, install sorry, more data actions. And essentially, Bubble is well known for having this gigantic ecosystem um, of different plugins, of different templates, etc. But what these will let you do is essentially extend what your bubble app can do via workflows. You know, if I look in email, okay, I've got a couple of things. I can send an email, I can send a meeting request, but again, I've got this little bit that says install more actions. And when I go to payment, there's no payment actions by default at all. I've got to install them. So let's click on that and see what's happening here. Well, essentially, this is going to take me to the bubble marketplace. And if I scroll down, there are a ton of different options for payments. Almost everything that you could think of is covered here. For example, you want to take payments in Bitcoin, there you go, there's a plug in there. You want to use Braintree, which is PayPal's payment processor, you can do it there. Um, you can take money from Coinbase, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, you can, you know, use use GoCardless. I, you can do stuff like verify, um, you know, bank account numbers with an IBAN uh, authenticator. Like, there is so much stuff in here that you probably won't even realise you need until you have a proper look through. Um, and some of the stuff that I really like, you know, at, at the end of the day, uh, you can take almost any payment provider you like. You can take PayPal and you've got multiple implementations of it. That's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, so sometimes a, a, a software provider or a, or a service provider will have built their own plugin for Bubble. But more often than not, it's going to be, you know, just a, a user like yourself who's come on, they run into a problem, you know, maybe they need PayPal, um, and they've just decided to to build their own version of it. And similarly, um, you know, if I look down at Stripe, which is usually my recommended go-to payment provider, you know, we've got a few versions here. One of them is by, uh, you know, Alex here, another one's by Lance, another one's by AirDev. And so you usually have to um, check out the plugin, make sure it does what you want it to do, make sure it's by, and, and by the way, you know, a lot of these are done by Bubble or verified by Bubble, so you're not really going to get anything malicious or dodgy on here, but you want to just make sure that, you know, for example, has the plugin been updated any time recently? Is it still getting regular maintenance, etc.? Because these are all individual bits of code and they can go out of date, you know. Um, now, thankfully, Bubble themselves have created a Stripe plugin here, but um, quite often one of the things I'll do is just look to see if there's a reputable company behind it. So AirDev, who I saw here, AirDev are really, really well known. They make a lot of Bubble plugins. They make a lot of, um, they do like a lot of uh, development work on Bubble. So typically you can rely uh, on their plugins for being pretty updated and also having somebody to email if something goes wrong. On the other hand, you know, I've got something here by Lance. I've got no idea who Lance is. Um, you know, that could be anybody. And actually there's a little sign here that says deprecated, you know, um, use a different version, uh, use version two of the plugin in the plugin store. So tons 
of really, really valuable, really important stuff in here. Just make sure you do a little bit of reading um, and know exactly what you're downloading and installing your app before you do it. But it's all safe. It's just more about making sure that it's going to be supported and updated, etc. Um, so moving on from there, you can check that out in your own time. Uh, again, if you look at analytics, you can go and look at your own analytics actions. But the other one I want to just dive into here is element actions. And we already looked at a couple of these in the last video, um, particularly the ability to show and hide elements based on you know a workflow. So those are really, really powerful because you can essentially control exactly how your interface looks depending on certain conditions or the way that the user interacts, um, etc. But there's some other cool stuff you can do here, you know, scroll to is going to let you force a screen to scroll down to a particular element. If you want to push the user, for example, from the top of the screen to the bottom, you can do that. You can animate stuff. Um, you can uh, you can change like what data is and isn't shown in a group. Um, and one of the cool things you can do here in a repeating uh, group is you can either force it to scroll down to a particular row on that repeating data group, or you can um, you can essentially do what we call pagination or pagination. Talked about this a little bit before um, in the fundamentals videos, but essentially if you've got a repeating data list, let's say there's 100 items on that list, but you only want to show 10 at a time on a page, well to do that we use a technique called pagination or pagination, however you want to pronounce it. I always hear people say pagination, but I'm fairly sure it must be pagination. Um, but essentially, you'll get a little thing at the bottom that says, okay, we're showing items 1 through 10. Click next to see, you know, items 10 through 20, next for 30, 40, so on and so forth. Well, essentially, using this workflow um, action here, show the next uh, and show previous, you can go ahead and create that pagination functionality on your own list. One for you to dive in and play with. Any plugins you install, they're going to show up here. And of course, you've got all these custom events. Now we'll explore um, some of this stuff in the next video around about API workflows, etc. Um, but if you're not finding what you need in the plugin marketplace, you're not finding what you need by com uh, combining this stuff, and you've got a little bit of know-how, custom events is a good place for you to come and uh, check out. So now that you understand um, the various actions available, and, and I know you're going to have to dive into that to really understand it and play with it yourself, but now that you've had a bit of an overview, let's go ahead and build something um, with a little bit more complexity than what we've done before. We are going to build the ability to rate our dog. And as you can see here, we've got you know the dog comments, what you're writing about the dog. Um, we've got a list of uh, for picking the dog. We've got various different dog ratings, um, and then we've got the button to submit it. And of course, that corresponds to um, some of the element names that we've got here. So if I double click that, we've called that ratings drop down. Uh, if I click this, we've called that a comment. Uh, and if I click this, uh, we've got our various different ratings. Now, I just want to show you something on this drop down. Now, I've set this up a little bit differently for this video, but let me show you how we had it set up before. If I just delete uh, a couple of things from this little list here and uh, I'll just set this to static choices. So previously we had the drop down set up like this. If you're watching the UI UX video, this would be familiar with you. We simply wrote the names of the dog, Milka, Mocha and Honeybee. Bear with that a wee second because I'm going to show you something else. So just keep in mind that's what we had before and then I'll come back and show you what's a little bit different. So if I leave that in static choices, we've still got our, our rating comment box, we've still got our radio buttons rating. But if I go back to the workflow and I hit click here to add an event, what we're going to do is essentially set an event to happen whenever the save rating button is clicked. And by the way, you can do that from here. I could come in, I could say an element is clicked, I could pick a button, you know, save rating. Alternatively, at any point you can come in to the design, just double click the button itself and hit start slash edit workflow. Now keep in mind that drop down, we'll come back to that in a second. But when I come in here, I want to add an action. So what do we want to do? We want to save a rating. Um, we then want to make sure that rating is updated on the dog so that we have the overall rating that will show up here. So we've got individual ratings so we can record, you know, who's rated what dog, what did you say about it, etc. But then we're going to have a total rating that shows up here. So we're going to need to do that. The first thing that we need to do then is create a new rating in our ratings database table. Uh, and by the way, just a quick reminder, we created that clearly in the first video, but we're saving the comment um, a relation to the dog. So we need to know exactly what dog role in the dog's database we're talking about. And of course, uh, the rating number. Now we we'll come back to the workflow, click add to action. We're going to go to data and things and we're going to make changes. Uh, sorry, we're going to create a new thing actually, because we're going to start by creating the rating. And so immediately Bubble is going to ask me to pick the type. Now if we remember, type just means it's just Bubble's way of saying a database table. 
and clearly the type we want to pick this time is ratings because we're going to create a new rating. And immediately Bubble has this little bit that says set another field. So you can go in and specify if you only want to create a couple of fields or you can hit add all fields and that will add in all the fields which are available for you to update. Now this bit's pretty simple in theory. You know, it just says comment equals. So it's saying, okay, well, what's the comment? And I can click the little bubble variable or data list um, and I can say, okay, well, we know we had that field called rate and comment. So I'm going to click rate and comment and I'll get this little part here that says, um, okay, well, do you want the value or is valid? So an input, when a user's put data into an input, it's always going to have a value. If the input field is empty, like it is here, then there's no value yet. However, or the value is just blank. However, when I type into this, I say, okay, uh, this dog is a good boy. Now the value of this input field is this dog is a good boy. And so when it's saying value, if I click that, that is what is going to get put into this comment box. It also has these other two options called is valid and isn't valid. And essentially that's a way of saying, you know, is the input considered okay? You know, is it considered valid to be put through? Um, imagine, for example, you're putting an email address into an input field, but the email address doesn't have, um, you know, this little at symbol here, then it wouldn't be valid. So what you can do is you can, you can have a workflow that says, well, if it's valid, you know, do something. If it's not valid, do something else. Um, and of course, the underlying answer to each of these questions, is it valid or isn't it valid, is simply going to be a true or a false. So right now, is it valid? The answer to that is true. So is it not valid? Well, the answer to that, of course, is false because it is valid. And so if I was to save that to my database, it would simply try and save either a true or a false. Brilliant if you're doing a Boolean value, but of course, you know, just going down the rabbit hole slightly there. You don't have to worry about that. We don't need that. All we need is the value. So nice and simple. You can do more things in there, you know, if you want to kind of do like, oh, the value is this, value is that, but you don't need to. You can just keep going. That's what I quite like about Bubbles Data, um, dynamic data list. You know, you can just keep going and, and getting down to more and more um, options, but we don't need that. So watch this. When I go in here, we need the rating drop down to pick the dog because this here is the rating drop down and there's the options but I don't have those options, um, you know, they're all greyed out. That is why I wanted you to remember the drop down. Let me show you what's went wrong here. So if we have a quick look at database, right, in that dog field, we're trying to get a dog relationship. We're not looking for the name of a dog. We're not looking for the breed. We want to know which role we want to get to. I need you to separate that in your head from the idea of the name equals the role because the name is just a random piece of data we've saved in this in this this row here. Bubble has no idea that the name is so important. I mean, it's not even the first row or, or the first piece of uh, the per first kind of piece of data, the first field that we've got in the database. You know, we've got breed, we've got description, we've got dog picture, and then finally we get to name. So although it's important to you and I, we immediately know, right? Okay, you know that dog's Mocha, that dog's Milka. Bubble doesn't care. Bubble doesn't know, and so. The problem that we have here is in this drop down, all I've done is write three pieces of text. I've wrote Milka, I've wrote Mocha, I've wrote Honeybee. That makes sense to you and I because we can read it. We're humans, we can read it. But to bubble, that's just random pieces of text. And so when you write static choices, what it means is we're just writing down the text that we want to appear. But because we're trying to use our workflow to give bubble a relationship, what we're going to have to do is convert this drop down to work with data as well. So if I click that and hit dynamic choices, now what happens, instead of me pulling out data, uh, instead of me kind of pulling out names and just writing them down as plain text, Bubble is now going to let me push data in there from my dog's database. So of course, as usual, you can select type, you could pick user, a bunch of other stuff, we're going to pick dogs. It'll then ask the choices source. You might remember this from uh, when we did the repeating data list. You've got to go in, you hit do a search for, and of course you select dogs and that will just bring back all the possible dogs. If you wanted to restrict that, you could put a filter in, but we don't, we just want all dogs as options. And then it's gonna say option caption. Um, now let me just delete the crap I've got in there. Option caption just means essentially what should actually show up here. Okay, we know we should have, we now know because we've set the drop down as a, um, you know, a list of dogs. We now know that we should have for each uh, each dog in a database row, we should have a little row here. What we don't know is, do you want to show the breed? Do you want to show the description? Do you want to show the name? Well, of course, 
it's pretty obvious we want to show the name. So we can do current option, which will grab the current row, and then we can say the current options name. So that's going to show the current options name. Now the funny thing is, um, I can show you that working. Of course it's going to look exactly the same if I refresh that. It's going to look exactly the same because all it's done this time is pull through all the dogs that we already had on our database. If I had a fourth dog in there, and I'll show you that soon, then we would have a fourth option there, but of course I don't, so we don't. So this is now dynamically pulling from the database. This is no longer just simple text, even though it looks exactly the same. Instead of me simply writing in Milka Mocha Honeybee, and I could have written anything, I could have wrote John Smith, Rachel, you know, uh, Wilson, whatever, I could have wrote whatever I want, but now it's pulling it from the database. Now, the interesting thing here is, because we've pulled that from a database, even though we're still selecting text, Bubble has now tied that to a database row. So if I select Milka, it knows I mean the Milka row in the database. If I select Mocha, then it's, you know, the same thing. So watch this. When I pop into workflows and I go back to my little create rating and I pick the dog, well, now the rating drop down is available. And it's going to pull through the dog. Again, I can pick the value. Of course, the value now will be the actual database row. It's all of that data. Um, and, you know, if you click more, you can see the rating drop downs values, breed, description, dog picture, name. That's because it's now, the value is now a link to the database. It's now saying, okay, you've selected that particular row in the database. Now, I only showed you the name, but I know as bubble underneath it that I've got the breed, the description, the dog picture, all that data from the database available. That's really, really powerful, you know. Um, and so... We'll move on from there. Uh, again, if I pop in here uh, for rating, what we want this time is the radio buttons. Um, so we've got these five here. They're all grouped together as one group and you pick the number. So we'll just again grab the radio buttons uh, ratings value. So just by doing that, and to be fair, that might have seen, uh, seemed slightly complex because we went through the whole rigmarole of the drop down, but simply by doing that, Close that. If I now ran this workflow, it would create a new rating in the database. But there's a couple other things we need to do. Um, so, okay, we've created a rating, but now we need to add the rating onto the dog's existing rating um, to start giving it one or giving it a total. So, when I click here to add another action, this time what I'm going to do, and by the way, I just want to uh, pause. Look what it says, reset relevant inputs. One of the cool things that you can do, two things actually here. Number one, Bubble is going to recommend you, um, you know, kind of, what your next action might be and that just saves you a bit of time but one of the cool things here is it's automatically bringing up this option to reset the relevant inputs what it means is now that you've created that you can tell bubble to automatically clear all of the data out of here so i might have selected you know rating five type yada yada selected a dog it will now automatically clear those inputs and to the user nothing's happened we've not told it to refresh the page go to another page I would literally just be seeing nothing except this, except the ratings would now disappear. Um, so you can do that, but what we are going to do is make changes to a thing, because now we've got a rating, now we want to update the dog's rating. So we're going to say make changes to a thing, and it's going to say the thing to change. And this is where things get interesting, because immediately I get this option you've not seen before, which is the thing to change is a result of step one. So I've just created a new rating, and now Bubble is telling me well, what, what, what do you want to change? Well, I'm going to say I want to change the rating that I just made, and I'll show you why in a second. I want to change the rating that I just made, but I want to go a little bit further because I want to change that rating's dog. So I want to change the dog related to that rating. That might sound a little bit confusing, but essentially, because I'm making a change to a specific dog, so I've just, let's say I've just created a new rating on Milka, and I've rated Milka 5 out of 5, and um, I, you know, I now need to find that database row. Now, I found it in this first video by specifying it through the drop down. But now I need a way to tell Bubble exactly what row I meant. Because although I've only got three dogs right now and I know them all by name, if this was a real website, I could have 10,000. So I need a way to tell. And the way I do that is by saying, well, I already know I've got a relationship to that dog based on the result of my first step. So let's just pick the dog and go from there. Now, one thing uh, just on top of that I want to show you, you might be tempted to say, okay, well, we want to change that dog's rating, so we'll go in here and go rating. Look at this little warning that Bubble gives you. You're trying to change a field, not a thing. At the minute, I'm trying to now change that entire ratings field. 
rather than just the rating of that specific dog of that specific row because I've added this extra bit. If I just delete key that back out, then I'm back to just trying to edit the dog row itself. And now I can hit change another field. This is the important part. So I come in here, I say I want to change the rating. And so what this is going to let me do is it's going to say, right, you've created a new rating, find the dog related to that, and then I'll let you change the rating saved for that specific dog. It's just a little nuance, but essentially Bubble is just so effortlessly, infinitely powerful that if you click the wrong thing in there, if you put in rating, then you'll accidentally change the entire field because Bubble just lets you do that kind of thing. It's good and bad. If you know how to do, use it, brilliant. Um, and I'll just show you how I'm setting that up again. If you know how to use it, brilliant. Um, if you don't, it can be a little bit overwhelming, a little bit confusing, but we come in here, we say, right, we want to change the result of step one, and we want to change step one's dog, so the dog related to step one, I click out from there, I can now change the rating, and I'm going to say, okay, what should the rating be? Well, the rating should be this dog's current rating, and then watch this, if I hit more, I can do a little plus symbol, and then I can do plus the radio buttons rating. There's a couple of ways you could do it. You could say uh, plus the result of step one's um, uh, rating. You could do it. You could again. You could pull it from the um, the radio button. You know, you've got these options. But what I'm saying is a little bit of math here. The dog's rating should now equal whatever the dog's rating already was, whether that's zero or a hundred or five. It should rate. It should be whatever the dog's current rating is plus the rating that I just gave it. So if Milka was rated 5 and I've just given it another 5 out of 5, then Milka should now be 10. Similarly, if Milka was 1 then I just gave it another 1, then the rating should now be 2, so on and so forth. And so that is really all you need to do there. You could change other fields if you wanted, but we just want to update the rating. And that is that. One last thing we want to do. So if you remember, I said when the user fills out all this in, even by the time they get to this step two, we've changed the database, we've changed the rating, but nothing's going to happen on the screen because we've not navigated the user anywhere. So I'm going to go to navigation and I'm going to tell it just to refresh the page. That's all. And so there we've got a workflow. It's a little bit more complex, you know, than the previous ones. It's really not that complex. All we've done is add some data there, change it there, refresh the page. But let's go back and see it in action. So I'll refresh this page just to pull bubbles updates through to the development environment. Now, okay, all the, the ratings are zero, 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 brilliant, fine. So we're gonna say, uh, I, we'll, we'll do Milka since we've been talking about Milka. Uh, this dog is very fluffy. Nice, clever comment. You can tell I'm very educated there. <laughs> um, and there you go, so I've set the dog as Milka, set the rating as five, let's hit save rating. My workflow is now running. The page is refreshed and look, the rating's updated to five. So the workflow just ran through perfectly there. If I go back and look at my data, uh, if I look at uh, Milka, you can see the rating's been updated. If I look at the ratings table itself, uh, it might take a few second to pull through here. Let me just refresh the page. This happens sometimes if you know I've got fields in there already. I'm gonna pick the ratings. There you go. So there's my comment pulled through. This dog is very fluffy. Rating five dog. You'll see, uh, you know, almost as a demonstration of what I was talking about with the drop down earlier. Um, you can see instead of, you know, simply saying the dog, and I know, and I know you've got a little search icon stuck over that, but it does say dog, as you can probably tell. Um, you know, it says dog, but it doesn't say Milka. It's got this random long ID. If I click that, that's telling me this is the unique ID of that dog row. Because you could have a million and one dogs called Milka, you know. Um, uh, you imagine if, if this was a real website, you're probably going to have genuinely a million and one dogs called something like Spot. Um, and so rather than, you know, have Spot 1, Spot 2, Spot 3, they've all just got this unique ID. And that's how we uniquely identify that particular dog versus all the other ones. So really nice and simple there. We've added Milka, it all works as expected. We could go do another really simple one as well. We could say add dog. Um, now, if I if I just quickly come here, let me just log in. I'll show you the add dog page for a quick reminder. If I hit log in, I've already made an account on the um, previous video. So now I can do add dog now that I'm logged in. It brings me to this screen here. It's a little bit wonky, I didn't design it very well. Uh, apologies about that. We've got dog name, dog description, dog picture, dog breed. Similarly, if we look at that on our design view, then we've got an input uh, called name input. 
we've got breed input, we've got description input, and of course we've got picture input. Pictures can be a little bit different, a couple of nuances we'll talk through there, but let's go into the workflow and we'll just do a quick workflow for adding a dog. So we'll do when an element is clicked, which will be our add dog button, or button add dog as it's called here. When that happens, and I'm going to, I'm going to put a wee quick specification in here just in case, just in case a user ever gets to that page without being logged in, I'll just make absolutely, absolutely sorry sure that they cannot log, log, log in, <laughs> that they cannot log in, uh, or sorry, they can't add a dog without being logged in. I'm not sure what happened to me there, I think I just... I think my brain just uh, broke slightly. Um, so we're saying the add button, uh, the add dog button is clicked. So when that button is clicked and the current user, actually, we need, sorry, we need to turn it the other way around, and the current user is logged in. So when the add dog is clicked and the current user is logged in, then we will create a new thing. And it's a good thing just to point out there, like it's quite useful that it writes us down. You saw I immediately, you know, I had that wrong the first time I said, isn't logged in because I was thinking, well, I don't want them to use this button when they're not logged in. But when you read that, it's saying, well, when the add the dog button is clicked and the current user isn't logged in, and you immediately that triggers something in your brain that says, oh, that's not quite right. So it's always good just to repeat this out loud and, and just read it and double check it because it's so easy to mix conditions up. The thing about, about, building without code and with and building with code you know they're really really similar in that you'll notice as you're doing this you're holding a lot of pieces of data in your head a lot of little um you know rules and conditions and things in your head one of the things you'll notice when you do this is when you've been building something for a long time you know when you've been sitting for a couple of hours building something without code you'll be really really in the zone you'll feel like you're flying you'll have all these wee um, pieces of data or things to remember sitting in your head and then somebody will interrupt you and it just goes, it just disappears, it takes you around you know, 10-15 minutes to get back in the flow and so one of the things I always do is write down little variables or little um, things that I'm making because otherwise it's really easy to you know, stop working on something for a weekend and then go back and be like, oh, I forget, I forget what I was, you know. Anyway, um, enough of the quick tips. So we're going to add a new dog. I'll hit add all fields. So we need to add a name for the dog, a rating for the dog, description, dog picture, breed. Um, so how do we start here? Well, we've already got inputs for most of these fields. So if I hit click, I've got the breed input, pretty simple. I'll do its value. And I've got the description input, pretty simple, plus its value. Dog picture, um, now we go to picture input and there's a few options here. So what will happen is Bubble has got this whole section on the left under data called the file manager. Every file that you upload uh, or that your users upload will end up in here. Now these ones on the right hand side say edit mode because I manually uploaded these in edit mode. However, these ones are ones that I've added previously when I've been playing with the add a dog functionality. And so it's got my current user, user's account unique ID. So at any point you can come in, you can see what people have uploaded, you can delete it, you can edit it, you can work with it, whatever you need to do. But as a result, when you upload a picture, it, it's always going to be saved there. That's the first thing Bubble does is it uploads it there. But when you put in the value, all it's telling Bubble is save this picture to the database as well. But it'll already be uploaded, so you don't always have to save a picture to a database. Simply by having that button, it will put it into your little asset manager. But if you do want to add it specifically to the database, you can do it here. A couple other things that are values. So um, uh, is loading basically means is the picture still uploading? Um, the file size, of course, is well. How big is the picture? So I could save, I could save another file here that says, okay, the dog picture is this, but another one that says, well, the dog picture's um, file size is, you know, ten megabytes, for example. Uh, sorry, I said another file that I meant another field. Um, so you've got file size, you've got upload percentage, i.e., is it ten percent uploaded so far? Is it ninety percent? Which is really good, by the way, if you want to do a progress bar, you could essentially have a workflow that just keeps checking. See when we're saying that, like. Um, Earlier we talked about do a, do something every five seconds. Well, another good one would be check check a file's upload percentage, and then obviously you know show it in a progress bar. Anyway, I digress. Nonetheless, uh, when we say dog picture, so we'll pick uh, sorry the picture input, and then we'll say that picture's value, and that will save it to the database. We've got name, name input, value, and then rating. 
I don't have a rating field here because by default a dog must start off with a rating of zero because it's new. Um, so I'm just going to type the letter zero, plain and simple, that easy. And that will now save um, the rating as zero. One other thing just to point out for a close off here, um, just because it's a little bug I've struggled with in the past, sometimes if you find that um, you're doing this picture's input value and the picture isn't uploading to the database, it's probably because of the file type. So depending on what files you need to upload, because I've said picture input, I mean this could upload any file I like, not just images. You know, depending on the file you want, just play around with that, double check, maybe if you've got a, you know, a JPG, check if you're not getting a full JPEG, like .jpeg, etc. You know, um, it's one to experiment with and play with a little bit. But adding a do a new dog is as simple as that. So what we can do is we can now force the user, and by the way, look, you've got that reset relevant inputs again. We can now force the user to go back to the homepage. So what's going to happen here is the user is going to create a new dog. We're going to upload that dog to the database, and then we're going to kick them back to the, the homepage so that they can actually see um, their new dog added to the list. And it really is as simple as that. Let's go in, refresh the page. Hopefully it keeps me logged in. Yes, it does. So we do dog name. Hey, we'll call this new dog. Please don't ever call your dog new dog. That's not very nice. We'll say this is a new and shiny and improved dog. I'm talking as if it's a robot dog. We'll call it a robo dog. Robo dog. And dog breed. Uh, we'll do a Sammy Ed again. You can tell I like Sammy Eds. And then click to upload a file. Uh, I can come in here. I'll, I'll pick the picture of Milka again. I don't know I'm doing the same picture, but it's just so you don't have to watch me go to Google and you know, download something. And you see there's a little unique ID there, a dog. So when I click that, it's just pushed me here. The new one uh, has just been added. So here we go, a new dog has just been added to the, um, the repeating data list. You could come in here, you could give it a rating because look, because we're pulling this from a database, it now says new dog down here. Even though we didn't manually add that to a drop down, it's just automatically pulled it in. I could say he is a very good boy. I could hit that with five. I could save rating. And there you go. The rating is updated. Now, I don't know if you saw that there, but just as a, a, a sort of interesting thing, um, it looks like Bubble actually updated that before it refreshed the page. That is clearly Bubble is just, you know, um, so dynamic with these values that it just keeps it refreshed and and it's kind of a good thing to think about in terms of um almost the progression of the 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 of a linear workflow you know um when when the rating's been added let's have a quick look at that flow there when that rating has been added you're creating a new rating then you're making changes to the dog and only then are you refreshing the page um, sometimes it's worth just playing around with exactly how elements flow, and making sure you know if you want something to update, make sure you're you're out, you know do you need to hide that from the user? Do you need to show it to them? Do you need to refresh a page? Do you need to move them? Is it the right order to update it? Should you be doing it the other way around, etc., etc. Um, so you know it's always worth just thinking about exactly how you do that. You could have, for example, you could put refresh page before you make changes to the dog's rating. Um, and it will happen. I think the thing that, that's that's good to keep in mind here is Bubble will move a million times faster than your own brain will. You know, it, it's quite easy to look. You could have 10 steps around here and you could think, okay, that's going to take a wee while, that's okay. It'll probably execute in a half of a second, if even that, a tenth of a second. You know, computers are going to move incredibly, incredibly fast. And I know you don't need to know that. I know that's really obvious, but sometimes it will shock you just how many things it will do. You could spend two hours building out this workflow that feels like it's so complicated and long and Bubble will just fire it off in a split second, you know, in the blink of an eye. Um, so really, really interesting, just one to keep in mind. Last thing I just want to talk about, um, and we'll just have a quick overview of it simply because uh, time is marching on. I just want to talk about these backend workflows. So everything in that uh, previous workflow that we looked at, you know, that's all kicked off by an element click or something like that. Here in the backend workflows, and remember these are enabled uh, by hitting this little bit in your API settings. But when I come in here, a few different things I can do. So you can set up a recurring event, and a recurring event is a little bit like a reusable workflow. It's just one that you save um, 
and you make it do whatever you want. You know, I could come in here, make it do this, that, the other thing, but it's just one that I then kick off with a different action. So I can set it to be, you know, it's going to relate to dogs and it's going to be the event name called Cool Event, etc., whatever I want to call it. But what I then need to do is at some other point, and it could be a different back end workflow or it could be a front end workflow, but at some other point in a workflow, you know, let's take, uh, say, Rain, for example, I need to come in here, I need to click uh, add a new action, I need to come to custom events, and uh, I need to hit set slash cancel a recurring event, and then I can come in here, I can pick cool event that I just made, I can decide what it's going to, you know, work on, yada, 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 change the frequency, is it daily, is it weekly, quarterly, you know, oops, um, and essentially I can just specify um, when this should be scheduled, so just you need to use that to get your recurring event going um you can put it in wherever you like you, know, you could have it on page load you could have it when a condition's true you could do it every five seconds whenever you want to do it but the thing to just bear in mind is don't put that step in here because it will never activate because it only activates when the recurring event does and of course the recurring uh, event will never activate because you've put that action to activate it inside the recurring event that can be a bit of a mind bender, but essentially don't put it in there because it won't work. But you can put anything else you want in there. You could say, right, refresh the page, terminate workflow, whatever. Oh, actually, one thing to bear in mind there, it won't let you change the page or navigate it or anything like that. You can terminate a workflow, but you can't change the page or anything because this isn't a front end. This isn't that this this workflow will run independent of a user even being on your app. So you can't refresh a page, for example, because there might not be anybody on your website for you to refresh it. So just keep in mind, um, not every action will be available because this doesn't really care if a user is on your app or not. It will run whenever you tell it to run. And that's kind of true of all these back-end workflows. They'll just run at any point. Another one that I want to point out, I'm going to ignore the API endpoint because we'll talk a bit more about that um, in the next video. But another one I want to just point out is this new database trigger event um, essentially it just says you know let's say dogs for example whenever dogs uh, is updated like when we just added a new dog or when we just changed the rating um, you know new dog rating so we could just do that uh, whenever the dog's updated and you do it only when you know and you get dogs now and dogs before change so what was the database like before the change what was the database like after you could say only when dogs now you know rating um you know as as you know, as whatever you can do, you can mess around with it, specify whatever conditions, but you know, um, you essentially you can play around with that and add in whatever you like, but that'll essentially say whenever a change happens in your database, and it and and if I took out this only when, by the way, I can just leave it as whenever any change happens here, or I can specify it, but whenever a change happens in my database then run this workflow, do whatever. And again, navigation is going to be missing because this is a back-end workflow. The user doesn't necessarily need to be on there. Um, but really, really powerful. You know, you can leave it for any change. You can specify specific changes. It's really, really cool stuff. So that is back-end workflows. You've seen how front-end workflows work as well. Hopefully, you, you've, you've seen a couple of things here. You know, I think number one... Um, just how powerful Bubble is, it's really, really flexible, and if there's something you can't figure out how to do, um, there's a good chance there's already a plugin that will do it for you, that will take away a lot of your extra work. And I think number two as well, you know, you've hopefully noticed that it's a bit of a double-edged sword, as much as there is a ton of um, uh, different options, different logic, different workflows you can do, at the same time, there's so many things that can go wrong, you know, so many little, um, almost just so much depth you can go to, especially with dynamic data list. Um, there's so many different things you can go into depth with that it's really easy to have something that looks like it should work, but it's not quite right. So, you know, that's just a natural learning curve and no code. You're going to have that in Bubble. You're going to have it in any tool. Um, maybe, you know, especially so in Bubble because it is so complex, but ultimately, uh, you know, don't get discouraged if you if you run into to little issues, if something doesn't quite work. At the end of the day, some something somewhere you're just gonna have to tweak it and and it should work from there. You know, there's almost always gonna be something that feels like it's so sensible, it should work, and then you stare at it for two hours or two days, whatever it might be, and eventually you go, Oh, I've got that around the wrong way, or oh I forgot this bit, or oh I forgot that bit. It happens in coding, it happens in no coding, it's really, really common. Um and then I think just that last bit as well, you know. As a result of that complexity, the time that you're going to be best at building, you know, these complex workflows and stuff like that, 
is when you're, you know, in a room, headphones on, really, really focused, and you can just keep all that information in your head because when you're building workflows, a lot of it, you know, you're only seeing a few things on the page. A lot of it is actually like almost like a flow chart you're building in your head. And so in that sense, you know, it can help to write it down as well. Anyway. That's just my tips on building uh, workflows with Bubble. Um, Bubble themselves have a ton more information, so if you want to go in depth in any of that, you know, check out other videos we've got on nocode.tech, but similarly, um, go and check Bubble's own resources as well. There's a ton of content out there. Bubble is probably the biggest tool community-wise, so you'll find a ton of documentation, a um, ton of content out there that will help you if you're stuck, and you can always let us know in the forums. But jump on to the next video, and we'll talk about, finally, how you can do APIs and integrations within Bubble.